Hello, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, a conflict transformation online summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. I'm here today with my colleague, Ben Roberts, who's holding, hosting the, the, the summit uh, together with me and Eva Schoenfeld. Welcome, Ben. And the two of us have the pleasure to welcome our dear guests for this interview, Bob Stilger. Hi, Bob, welcome. Hi, good to be with you. Yes, great to have you. Bob, you, you've been, you have an amazing life journey. I would say exploring the, the role as a facilitator and, and catalyst and uh, supporter of community development. You, you founded New Stories and, and has been serving as president of, of the, this organization. Uh, you've been executive director of the Northwest Regional Facilitators for, some, for, for many, many years. Uh, you've, you've done such an amazing work with uh, different, different, in different spaces, with families, with communities, uh, and you worked also with Meg Whitley on the Perkana Institute and Christina Baldwin on, from Peer Spirit on a global leadership initiative called From the Four Directions. And you've worked with Art of Hosting, uh, and you've been working with many, many people throughout the world on how to build healthy communities. And I, I guess that's like the main reason why uh, it's, it's, um, we've, we've invited you in, but I mean, it's impossible to explain your journey in just a couple of sentences. So maybe we could start just by inviting you to share a bit of how you how you kind of entered in this space of community development and 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 what what has been the drive for you in this journey in this kind of line of work working through stories and community support tell us a bit about how what have, what was your call well you know in some ways i think maybe what I bring to this call is the fact that I've been bumbling along for about 60 years now and consequently have more bumbles under my belt uh, than, uh, than most people do. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Christina Baldwin. I remember a number of years ago, Christina and I were, were having coffee and, and she asked her what she was up to and, and she said, well, I'm doing my uh, uh, my update uh, um, to my to the one year plan of my five year plan, and I kind of wow, that's really cool. I don't know that I've ever really known anybody who's had a a one year plan or a five year plan, uh, um, and not that I'm opposed to it, but it was just like this really interesting contrast that. That's not the way that uh, that my life has worked, uh, and what I understand overall about my life uh, at this point is that my life has very much been spirit led. Uh, you know, back when I used to uh, talk about having a fairy godmother who uh, 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 who hit me on the side of the head and opened up doors, and and I chose whether to go through them or not. And as I settled down, I started just speaking of, of spirit uh, uh, as opening doors. Uh, and, and then sometime in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I realized that any time that I had seen a door that spirit opened, there wasn't a choice that I just went through it. Uh, um, and I don't, I have to be cautious about trying to understand my life. I don't. Uh, uh, I've, I've managed to, to live a life that has been uh, um, uh, filled with connections and relationships with, with people on most parts of this planet. And in many ways, I think it, it actually started, you know, my, when I was 10 years old, 
uh, I started working for the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. And I was there for the next 15 years. Uh, when I was eight and nine, I decided that picking strawberries and beans was not a career path uh, that I wanted to pursue. And Spirit opened this door uh, to OMSI. And at first when I was there, I, you know, I, I, I thought that I was supposed to be a scientist because it was a science museum. Uh, um, and it was years later that I realized that what really intrigued me about OMSI was that it was a place of people. And at a very early age, uh, coming from a, uh, a low income working class family, uh, 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 even before I was a teenager, I was rubbing shoulders and working with both the richest people and the poorest people in Portland, Oregon. And one of the things that I started to discover early on was that uh, uh, kindness, generosity, uh, uh, forthrightness uh, uh, were actually pretty evenly distributed across all income ranges, uh, uh, that nobody had a monopoly on that. And that there were uh, uh, there were assholes who were rich and there were assholes who were poor and there were extraordinarily wonderful, uh, 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 kind and giving people who were rich and who were poor. And I think in some ways, you know, that was a, that was a deeply formative experience for me in terms of beginning to understand the power of community. As you said, in my 20s, <clears throat> I started doing a lot of, of local community development work in Spokane, uh, uh, where I had, had been called to uh, uh, create something called the Environmental Symposium Series at the World's Fair here. About 20 years into that local community development work, I realized that we were really doing good things to, uh, to help individual people lead better lives, live better lives. Uh, um, but we weren't doing anything that was changing the underlying conditions that required people to need that kind of help to live better lives. And it was kind of like the sense of, of putting fingers and holes in the dike. And there were just more and more holes and, and not very many more fingers. And so this question of, of what, what makes enough of a difference to make a difference was the one that started to animate my life. I ended up stepping away from the nonprofit that I co-founded when I was 25 uh, um, in 2000, when I was 50. Uh, um, and the next 10 years was mostly a journey of working with people from the global south, from Zimbabwe and South Africa and India and Brazil and Mexico, who uh, uh, we in the United States look at as uh, uh, as not having as much or not having as having enough. Uh, uh, and it was a journey of, of, of truly going into deep relationship and deep places with, uh, uh, with people who were building healthy and resilient community with what they had. Uh, um, I'm just reminded of a, of a story from Brazil during that period where uh, um, uh, I had come into relationship with the people who had started uh, Warriors Without Weapons and the Oasis game back in the very beginning. And we fell in love with each other. Uh, uh, what happened was they were just about to, to give it up. You know, okay, this was a nice thing to be doing when we're, you know, in our early 20s, but it's time to get serious and get real jobs. And I came in and and listened to their story of what they'd done and how they how they'd done it, and I was just I was overwhelmed with gratitude, overwhelmed with thanks, and I mirrored that back to them at a time having someone outside of the system who was saying to them, "Oh my God, what you're doing is so important and so incredible and so needed in the world right now," that it helped them see that themselves in a new way and be willing to take the next step. So we started off, <laughs> we just started off in love with each other. Uh, um, and, and several years later, uh, uh, after we'd helped them uh, um, receive a grant for uh, 
uh, more than $100,000 for beginning to, to, to move warriors without weapons out more broadly. Uh, um, it's interesting that uh, uh, with the theme of, of, of your summit, uh, uh, we got into, uh, uh, we certainly got into conflict. You know, the, uh, uh, the, the love that was there became more uh, uh, brittle. Uh, uh, and, and it was clear that the relationship was falling apart. And, and for all of us, it was sad. And, and there was anger. And I just got to a point where, where I, I just knew that I had to get on a plane and I had to fly to Brazil for a weekend because the only way we had a snowball's chance in hell of sorting this out was by being together face to face. And it was about money. You know, money was at the core of the, of the, of the challenge. Uh, uh, and, whew, I'm so glad that we had a strong foundation of love. And we got, we just got deeply into the, uh, the tensions and the conflicts between the global north and the global south. And the, and the why is it uh, uh, that you get to be paid to reflect and we don't? Why is it that you get to control the money and we don't? Why is it? And, and, and we were going in to those questions with uh, um, with love and with curiosity, and it was hard. It's really hard. Um, <laughs> I always remember, you know, we—I don't know—we'd been at it for, uh, uh, gosh, maybe twelve hours by that point, spread over a couple of days, and and Rodrigo, uh, uh, dear friend Rodrigo, uh, Rodrigo said, "Okay, let's just." Let's just, let's just pause. Let's just let it go and, 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 and settle in and, and speak to how we're feeling right now. And Rodrigo and Mariana had had a, had a baby about uh, maybe three or four weeks before. And I'm sitting there, I'm trying, you know, how do I describe this, this turmoil, this, this, angst, this feeling of just totally fucked up and confused and all of that. And I'm searching for words for it. And Laura, their baby, does explosive vomiting all over my back. <laughs> and it's like, that's it. Oh my God. That's how I'm feeling. <sighs> and it's how we were all feeling. And we got through it, you know, we, we, there was enough, there was enough love in that system that we were able to hold uh, um, this, you know, it wasn't just our anguish, it was the whole anguish of colonialism, it was the whole anguish of domination and control, it was the whole anguish of ways in which those with position and power and wealth have treated those without those things for many centuries. So it wasn't just us. It was that whole legacy in the room. So, you know, in my, going back to my story, my life story, it was 10 years of, of uh, 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 working in, in that system. Uh, um, and in, in 2010, I was asked to bring what, um, uh, what we've been learning about leadership and about building healthy and resilient communities into Japan. And 2010 in Japan was this extraordinary year. The Liberal Democratic Party that had been in power uh, since World War II had been kicked out. Uh, there was a sense of change in the air. Uh, uh, people were looking for new ideas, new possibilities, incredibly generative time. 
when the triple disasters happened on March 11th, 2011, many of us who had gotten connected in 2010 looked back and we said it was like spirit gave us a head start. So many things, so many relationships that got formed in 2010 were foundational in terms of the work that many of us did after the triple disasters. Uh, um, most of my work for the next six years uh, uh, was in Japan with communities in the disaster area, as well as other parts of Japan, trying to make sense out of this. You know, it's like, how do we create a future that we want rather than the government just rebuilding the past? I remember waking up one morning in 2016 uh, uh, and it just came over me that uh, the, the work that I had set out to do in 2011 was complete. Didn't mean that I didn't have more work and more relationship with Japan, but that, you know, there was a completion, it was an energetic completion, uh, uh, which of course produced an immediate, oh shit, who am I then? You know, I have this whole identity of, of Bob, the guy from Japan, uh, uh, but that didn't, that, that collapse of, of, uh, of self didn't last for too long because I realized it was time for me to, to bring my attention back to the country of my origin, back to the United States, which if it didn't start to change, uh, uh, the rest of the world was pretty well uh, uh, screwed. So I came back, I was immediately invited to, uh, um, to bring the learning from Japan into the fire affected counties of Northern California. Uh, um, the journey last year in paradise, uh, uh, the community uh, of 27,000 that was obliterated in fires at the end of 2018 uh, uh, was a, uh, uh, very incredible journey because it came at a time that uh, um, that some of us who had, had worked so hard in Japan were coming back together and, and, and talking about, so what happened? You know, there was this sense of, 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 aha, this is the time that a new Japan gets born. Uh, uh, what happened? Those prior years were really, really hard and demanding. We all gave everything that we could. And we had to look back and say, you know, for the most part, if you look at Japan in 2018 and Japan in 2010, uh, uh, they look pretty much the same. There's a few notable exceptions, but yeah, there's no big transformation here. If we go down leap deeper, yes, there's a, there was a transformation, is a transformation in terms of people waking up and saying, I want to live a different life than the one I've been living. Those are the seeds of transformation that got planted that will unfold for many decades now. But then in terms of anything visible happening, no. And, and in paradise, that, that took us took me and took us into questions uh, once again of of what makes enough of a difference to make a difference you know what actually creates change how do we not simply reenact the same old patterns in a tastier flavor or better colors or something more uh, um how do we actually shift in ways that make a difference Well, I was on a call, you know, then one more thing, I was on a call just a couple days ago and, and somebody was saying to me, wow, you've been doing all of this, this work for so many years. Uh, uh, tell me about the difference it's made. And I had to say, yeah, I don't know yet. I don't know. So. Yeah, well, uh, 
Yeah, so many things that came up. Maybe I'm going to focus on a couple of them. Mm. One is really this, this experience you had in Brazil with the Warriors Without Weapons um, group that for me is really interesting because one of the things I think that it illustrates is how much when you come to a, when you are in a space of relationship and collaboration, there's all these traumas, these, these uh, issues from, our, from us having grown up in a, in a society of separation where things like money are, are in, in its nature so, so um, problematic that, that then this, this gets in the way of the relationship and, and you, you, you were able to hold, to hold, to go through that journey together and, and kind of address that. So it's not like it's something that actually was happening in the relationship, but was pointing at something larger than, than the people involved in that space because it's, in, it's, it's related with historical relationships of exploitation, of, of, uh, of abuse uh, on, on a wide scale. So that, that's really, I think, interesting and points out to a lot of things about the nature of some of the conflicts that take place today in our daily lives with each other and in communities. And then what I'm kind of, what I'm kind of thinking, like looking at then the other studies you, you, you told about is communities go through a journey and, and obviously you've been in touch with communities in, in moments of trauma because they, they just went through a certain event like the, the disaster in, in Japan or the fires in paradise which kind of offers a particular uh, insight into a moment, a critical moment in a community. But you've been working in communities in all sorts of stages of development. And I'm curious to see like, what do you think makes a community healthy and resilient enough to be able to hold these difficult issues, situations, either it's a, cat a catastrophic event or a conflict within the community that really kind of grounds the community in a way that they can be with that and and you know get get out get out of it stronger or in a in a in a good place even if they don't if the relationships don't don't continue or so yeah could you please tell us share a bit like what has been your observations working with communities for so long You know, disaster and <clears throat> disaster and collapse are, are interesting uh, uh, interesting bedfellows. It's always so interesting how uh, uh, when uh, when there's the when there's these monumental events there is almost immediately, almost everywhere, this, this uprising of human goodness, this willingness to reach out, this willingness to help each other. It's kind of like the, the, the event knocks us out of our old patterns. You know, for a while, uh, uh, we can forget that I think you're a jerk. You just become a human being. Uh, I don't even have to figure out if you're a jerk. You're just somebody who's putting up sandbags next to me. You're just somebody who's serving a meal next to me. You're just somebody who's grieving next to me. And, and suddenly all of, this, all of this baggage that we've, that we've accumulated in our own lives and in our ancestral lives uh, um, doesn't get nearly as much attention from us as right now, right here, who we're with and what needs to be done. And I was going to say, it doesn't last for long. And that's partially true, that there's a, you know, the way that I experienced it in Japan, 
uh, uh, on a broader scale uh, is that the, uh, the, there was this one time we were doing a, a, a gathering just uh, two weeks after the disasters in Tokyo. And we'd almost, um, we'd almost canceled it because it was so hard, it was so heavy. Uh, 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 people just didn't know uh, um, how to make any sense out of this. And we went ahead. And I, I remember people coming into the room, because we're in Japan and you, you know, I said I was gonna be there, so I'll be there. And nobody wanted to be there, right? It's like the last thing they wanted to do was to have to talk to people because that meant they had to figure out what was going on inside of them. They're Japanese, they showed up. Everybody's coming in, they're staring at their, at their shoe tips uh, uh, and they're walking through molasses. Three hours later, uh, the room was just filled with excitement. And the contrast between those two was so great that I'm going, you know, what the hell? What, what happened here? And I actually had to go to, the, to, to a corner in this room and just quiet myself down with this question of what's happened. And this really loud voice comes into my heart mind. And, and it says, we have been released from a future we did not want. That was the energetic impact at a social scale and maybe at an individual scale. It's, I have been released from stories I do not need. And at the same time, arising alongside of that is an almost irresistible force to get back to the old normal. You know, this, this ambiguity, this confusion, this not knowing, it's okay for a day or two or maybe a month, but you know, it's kind of what we're going through with COVID and the pandemic right now. It's kind of like, would you please get me back to where I know what to complain about? So we have those two forces. We have that force of release and we have that force of return that always arise with disaster. And part of our question is how do we hold open the crack between those two forces for long enough for something else to emerge? I don't remember what question you answered, asked, but that's my answer. <laughs> All right. I think Nunu asked two, to pose two questions or topics, right? One was, you know, what allows a community to have the resilience required, um, you know, to, to survive these shocks and to move forward, the, the love that you described with the group in Brazil, or, you know, I don't know, perhaps in Japan, it was this collective sense of something, of a desire for a different future that, that supported people in moving through. Um, the other, the other question was about money. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if we want to go back there or not. Oh, there's always questions about money. Yeah, there's um, always. But, to, okay, but to stick with the first one for a second, I mean, I, it's kind of like we, disaster reminds us of our deeper humanity. And then we forget then we get invited back into habitual action, into habitual patterns, into what we've done before. Uh, 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 this, this space of it doesn't matter if we like it or not, at least we know how to do it. And one of the questions is, so I, you know, so like one of the discoveries that I had when I started sharing stories out of Japan is I'd, I'd invite people to, to be in storytelling trios and to, to tell the story of uh, um, how after their life had fallen apart, how they found their way forward. And we've all got those stories, you know, it's the, uh, uh, it's the, uh, uh, the, 
the, the person who walked out of our lives when we thought we'd be together forever, uh, uh, or the, uh, the, the company that we worked for that, uh, uh, that gave us the, the pink slip and said, thank you very much, and, and don't, let the <clears throat> don't let the door hit you on the way out. Uh, uh, or the school that didn't admit us when we were applying for college, or the death of a loved one, or, or, or. And I, I asked, didn't ask people to tell the story of what happened, but I asked them to tell the story of how they found their way forward. And one of the things that became clear in that is that those of us who are alive now are survivors. We have in our DNA that gene that allows us to enter into diverse adversity and find a way out, that we have a inborn capacity for resilience that gets stimulated in times of disaster. So it's there. And the real question is how do we, how do we keep bringing that to the surface together? Because it is together, you can't do it alone. Uh, uh, how do we keep bringing that to the surface and working with it? So I would say, that every community, that every person, that every context has an inborn capacity to be resilient. And we just have to remember that. We have to recognize that. We have to refeel that. Uh, um, and we're not very good at that. Yeah, what I'm hearing you saying is basically that to, to be aware and trust that every community has in itself what it needs to continue his development path that yes yes and and it, it's, al sense. it's also the case that that kind of of of, of self-reliance prospers with interdependence you know we sometimes think of self-reliance and interdependence as being adversaries or separate hmm. and they're not there are they're, they're they're kissing cousins and when they're both present in the system prosperity uh, uh, arises So actually, I was thinking like one of the things that I, it's it's striking in uh, in in disasters or you know in in major uh, disruptive events that people face is that not everybody but a lot of people uh, see clearly or recognize and value that le the level of interdependence and the connection between them. Like <clears throat> that is important to hold somehow each other in, in that space. But another thing I'm curious also to, to explore a bit with you, Bob, is like you touched on something that is very curious for me, which is like in the, in the, in the, in the accident in Japan, people that actually it released people from a story about the life and the future that they didn't want it. So also there's this sense, what I'm hearing on, on the back of it is that when you are faced with a disruptive event, which could be in a, in a way simple thing like a conflict between two people in a relationship, that that offers possibility, a lot of, that's a place of possibilities for many different kinds of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and situations after that. So how we hold that and the kind of how that space can open up for imagination because I think the problem with some of the stories you've been living is that people cannot imagine other ways of living or other ways of being and that's the kind of yeah. I'm gonna go back to the familiar so yeah. I wonder like if you look back at COVID now and where we are mm. at, as communities like what does this space is calling us to do I mean we, we started preparing for the, the interview to talk a bit about this like what is this, what are the questions we are not doing? What is this space asking from us as individuals and communities? Acknowledging also this, this that maybe uh, part of us wants to go back to the familiar places, but part of us also knows that that was not serving us that well. You know, I'll tell you a story about something that, uh, that we noticed in Fukushima. Um, you know, Fukushima is very precious. The, the damage from the, so the triple disasters are this 9.5 earthquake 
follow, followed by a, uh, a 20 meter, 60 foot high tsunami rushing at, at, at 50, 60 miles an hour, followed by the nuclear explosions. The, the destruction from the earthquake, pretty easy to clean up pretty quickly. The, the destruction from the tsunami, uh, um, not as easy, much, much more difficult, but something that can be cleaned up. Uh, um, and so when the area is hit by earthquake and tsunami, there's the, there's the possibility at the material level, at the surface level, of going back to what was. In Fukushima, there's no what was to go back to. The past is obliterated. It's gone. We're done. And even Fukushima, I'm talking about the, the coastal region closest to the reactors. And, and, and that's where the learning continues. But one of the things that we noticed early on in Fukushima was that there were those people who had had, had, had a way to leave and they had gotten the hell out. There were those people who, if they possibly could, they would leave, but they were trapped. There were those people who said, this is home and I'm not going anywhere else. And were those people who had never had a relationship with Fukushima who said, I'm going there. That's where I'm supposed to be. So those four groups. I've seen those four groups or ones like them arise in every disaster context. And, and I, don't have a, I don't have a value judgment about one being right, one being wrong. They've each got their, their own potentials. They've each got their own tragedies. I will say that my work is with the last two groups, the ones who have said, this is home and I'm not going anywhere, or the ones who felt a calling to be there. So there's, but there's always those different stories, okay? The question is, how do we support those people who name this home and who are willing to do the hard work to create something new. And I'm, I'm taking one of the things that I've been doing for, uh, uh, for five or six years now um, and may not be able to this year because of COVID uh, uh, is doing a learning journey for people from Japan to Fukushima uh, to stand and in, in solidarity, to stand as witness and to learn what people there are learning. There was a rice farmer, Sugeno-san, who I met for the first time last fall on the learning journey. <clears throat> it was just after the, you know, oh, it was just after the typhoons had hit the, the, the Fukushima area with, uh, with great ferocity, unexpected ferocity. And so much that had been done over the last six years was undone. And so Gano san says, you know, I've realized that I'm not here to fix problems. I'm here to live my life in ways that bring me joy. Okay. Come back to COVID. You know, I remember hearing from people uh, uh, in, the, in the first weeks of, of, of isolation and lockdown. It was kind of like, they were all in that, get me the hell out of here. You know, I'm going crazy. I'm locked in this house. My kids are in this house. They don't have school anymore. We can't do anything to escape. This is just insane. Let me out. And two or three weeks later, there's, there's some people who are still saying, this is insane. Let me out. And there's other people who are saying, huh, you know, Actually, it's really nice not to, to drive an hour or two to go to my office and, and do the things that I can do just as well from home. And, and, 
it's kind of nice being around my partner and my kids. You know, on a call where one person was saying, well, you know, I, I was really glad that uh, 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 that I was I was hosting the Zoom call and I was I was doing the the technical work, so I wasn't in a in in a breakout room. I was just alone when my daughter screamed, "Mama, mommy, 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 come!" and and then she goes on to describe how her daughter had wanted to see her poop on the carpet because she wanted to see what it looked like, uh, oh, and. <laughs> And, and she's and she's sharing the story with us, and it's kind of like and then she go, oh, maybe I shouldn't be sharing the story, but it's kind of like no, no. Part of what isolation has done is it's brought us into closer connection with the fullness of people's lives. So there's some people in the pandemic who are the same as those people in Fukushima who said, this is my home. I'm not going anywhere. People have been rehomed in the pandemic, and it's incomplete, but there's things that people are not going to give up. People, things that people didn't know were precious until they experienced them during these last two months. And, and, they, and, and part of the transformative question is how do, we, how do we support each other as we work within and out of those experiences of you know, this is actually the life I want. Help me call it in. There's a there's a theme and a metaphor I'm I'm sensing in <laughs> between the Brazil story and the one you just told of, of um, these unexpected and normally unwelcome excretions from young people. <laughs> transform the situation you know and um you know conflict is like that we, we we our standard standard stories about it are you know this is shit this is you know you're and you're vomiting on me i mean this is not this is not something i you know i want this contained and out of the way or not happening oh. at all and yet here are these two little stories of it literally being transformational and generative and and i'm wondering if there's something you know there's some message there yeah, it's like a conflict is a spillover. It's something like wants, wanting to be noticed or... Well, and, and the messiness itself has, there's some beauty in it. There's some, you know, there's some awakening. There's power in that stuff. It's strong. It's smelly. It is not, we don't want it where it is, but here it is. And, you know, we have a choice of how to deal with it. We can oh. you know, the energy to work with there one way or another. Well, and then the you know, so you make me think immediately of a, uh, uh, of a, uh, a growing schism, a huge conflict, and fragmentation in my uh, uh, Unitarian Universalist Church community in Spokane, uh, uh, that started about ten months ago, uh, uh, and it's come to the point of being irreconcilable. Uh, uh, you know, the, the congregation is in, in, in this arc of time uh, um, uh, uh, completely split. And the only real question is who's going to keep control of the assets and the, and the identity uh, and either retain or let go the minister. Uh, um, that is a conflict that is not going to be resolved. You know, and it's 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 sad. It's hard, uh, uh, but part of uh, uh, part of this, I think, right now is is all of us in the in the different contexts that we're in, uh, uh, stepping stepping toward the question of what do we step away from, what do we let go of, uh, uh, what do we say? You know, I'm sorry that this has become so bad, but I can no longer invest my life energy in coming to some sort of, of reconciliation or resolution. Mm. That's part of the dissolving, I think. Yeah. That's quite interesting because it's, um, so just, just to signal we are getting close to the end, so. Uh, oh, we just started. Yeah, we just got started. That feels like that. Yeah. 
This is just a teaser, my dear. So one, uh -huh. one of the things that comes for me with this that I think is, is a very important um, message to go through is, is it, it's not like we are going to get into a place in our lives where we'll be able to say we are masters of conflict <laughs> transformation or so like there's there it's always it's always a, a unique experience because we are always faced with this challenge of of how to be in that place and sometimes acknowledging that there's uh, there's not no possible it's impossible to reconcile this kind of oppositions or or um, forces going in different directions, but there's something around that you. I think from your stories, uh, it's it came clear to me that is something about this moment of of, of disruption. Either it's because it's a, a disaster, or it's something in between people, or even inside of us that offers. Uh, a possibility of, 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 of finding new treasures, of discovering something or of finding something that can open up new possibilities for us as communities, yeah. as individuals. And I think that's something we, I think it's, we should all have in mind when we are faced with a conflict, either in our families or in our communities or inside of us. It's like, what is it, what is it that is really, really happening here? what is it that it was really wanting to become to be noticed and trusting that if we take if we take enough time something will will unfold and sometimes it might not i mean you've been that in in the church 10 months that this is going on and well there's a there's certainly a uh, there's a stepping towards the disruption and there's a letting go of knowing and stepping towards the not knowing. The challenges often are that <clears throat> when we take that to a systemic level, uh, um, number one, it takes a hell of a lot of knowing to be able to step towards a place of not knowing. And number two, unless most of the people in the system have a common commitment to that journey, at a systems level, it's not going to work. So if you have, if and like in, in this Unitarian Universalist Church situation, uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a group of people that are willing, able to step towards the disruption. And there are those who are saying, no, we just need to go back to the way it was. And so the fundamental premises that are present in those two groups are diametrically opposed. Uh, uh, and you can't, you can't reconcile unless you've got common ground. Common, and in, that includes common ground at the level of consciousness or mindset, uh, uh, as well as common ground in terms of skill set, as well as common ground in terms of understanding the, 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 the surrounding culture. Uh, um, and it's like right now, at least in the United States, it's really uh, 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 the, the ways in which the isolation of pandemic has both created greater connection and has illuminated greater fragmentation at the same time. I was talking with someone a couple of days ago about how, you know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, I actually uh, uh, have uh, um, uh, the <clears throat> there's ways in which the, our connection virtually during COVID time has enabled us even more to live within our uh, uh, within our uh, um, uh, our self-authored bubbles, uh, and and we don't have to encounter encounter people who are in their other uh, self-created bubbles. They're just off there someplace, and I can ignore them in some ways. At my peril, of course, uh, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's this interesting dynamics around connection, fragmentation, isolation, relationship 
that are so present within these COVID times. Okay, uh, yes, thank you so much, Bob. So many things. I, I would spend another <laughs> two hours talking with you and Ben. Um, <laughs> we just got started. But uh, yeah, I just want to say um, that perhaps you mentioned something. So it's like one of the things I was saying is there's no, there, there's no end point. So, mm. so that, that's a very important thing that, that, that I kind of read in between the lines of some of the things we talked is there's no, never a promise of an arrival to, you know, like a all your disc kind of thing of a, an arrival to an happy ending. There's just the possibility that every time we meet I mean, there's something that we know that every time we meet conflicts and every time we meet disruption in our lives, it's, it, it, those are the moments where we kind of sense that our movement of our life journey kind of is formed because it's how we respond in those moments that makes us who we are as individuals and as communities. So there's always this kind of, we're never going to know how this is going to end, this, this situation we are in, just like we never know how a, a conflict in a relationship is going to unfold. But there's this sense that if we go into there with this kind of curiosity and openness to try to understand what's happening, so this means that we need to know some things in advance, know how to deal with our emotions, how to deal with the things that are the dramas that are happening inside of us and the dramas that might be happening in between us and look at that with curiosity and not go uh, on, a, on, a, on a fixed um, kind of fixed identity, fixed kind of sense of righteousness. So th these are some of the things that came up for me that are really important in a way for us to, to figure out that there's no magical solutions but we know that there's hints into how to be in difficult and, and situations. And maybe, maybe Ben, you want to add something? Um. Sure. I mean, there was, there were so many lovely stories and, and, and insights woven through there. I think the thing that I'm, really taking away our, our questions as well, things that were hinted at or prompted that went through my mind that, that in fact, in some cases we didn't, we didn't go into. Um, but, but, you know, I got the whiff of, for example, in the, in the story about the congregation, right? There's this question of, well, maybe, it, maybe it's supposed to fall apart. Maybe this is the best yeah. thing. You know, we, I think we have an attachment, particularly in our, in our developed Western, you know, patriarchal culture to things lasting forever. And this is some, you know, this total disconnection from death. Um, and, and so what, you know, what needs to be let go of and composted and how do we discern that versus, you know, when is the love and the value of what's there so powerful and strong that we hop on a plane and we, and we, you know, give our all to save something and go through the pain of the conflict and the difficulty because we, we know we trust there's something on the other side. Um, yeah. How do we discern that? And I, I think there's um, there's a piece at the community level that seems very critical with that. You know, that's where so much of your work has been and continues to be. And and I, I think, you know, when you were answering the question about what what allows communities to be resilient in the face of these challenges, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, well yeah sure and we've we've so much of that has been eviscerated in so many parts yeah. of the world and maybe that's part again of the contrast you're drawing between the developed north and the and the so-called less developed south but those are often places where those community ties are much richer and more intact yeah. they have that wealth um and maybe that's the wealth that's that's mattering more i i, I don't know but but in the places where we've lost that right I, I see your work so much focused on the question of how, how and where can we can we create that again, whether you know in place, you know, and perhaps in in new ways of thinking about place or in 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 ways that aren't necessarily grounded in a single place is part of my inquiry, um, but 
you know, clearly if that's, you know, as your colleague Meg Wheatley used to say, whenever the problem community is the answer. And if we've, if we've, if we've lost so much of that answer, what do we, you know, how do we respond to that? So I'm, I'm leaving with that as well. Um, one more question was around the money piece that, that got hinted at and not answered. But you know, I think there was this, you talked about how there's this sense of new possibilities and people yearning for a different life, but then this pull back to the old ways. And I think so much of that pull has to do with what's financially viable for people yeah. or the choices they totally. have to make, right? And, yeah. and so you know, what would the world look like if everyone who wanted a different world could, could make their living building that world instead of having to make a living, you know, maintaining the one that, 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 that isn't serving them and others. Um, and so, I, you know, on the one hand, whether it's at a personal level or at the systemic level, money's the problem. Money's what we fight about. That's a cliche. And, you know, there's all these people talking about, well, we need new kinds of money, new ways of doing things, or we need to do things without money. And I think all of that has beauty and value. I'm also really curious, are there transformative ways we work with money so that it becomes a force for healing um, or the conflicts that arise around it are, are also generative. So um, it's been very provocative in all those ways, Bob. And I love you. I, I love your energy. It's great to hear more of your stories after working together for so long and realizing I, we haven't actually made time for this kind of thing. Um, and the story, I think of all the stories, my favorite was the rice farmer, you know, and his shift. and that, that joy as, as a core value seems so, I mean, it's different from love because, you know, you might love something, but you still are going to lose it and have to let go. But, but joy is this path forward that seems to offer some clarity and some answers. So where is the, can we learn to find joy in conflict? There would be a transformation. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe, maybe it's the balance. Bob, do you want to say something before we close? Sure, a couple things. One, I, I got to go back to that rice farmer. Uh, uh, part of his amazing story <clears throat> is that he has been, um, he's an organic rice farmer. And he's now done uh, uh, nine years of, of research with the University of Nagata. And here's the really interesting surprise. If you, his soil is still radiated. It's not a high level of contamination, but it's contaminated. If you plant rice in contaminated organic soil, the contamination remains in the soil. The organic soil holds it. If you plant rice in industrialized soil, that's contaminated. The contamination goes up into the living quality of the rice. Wow. We've got nine years of research that shows this is, this is so. I'm trying to get the research into English because it's, such, it's so important and it's such an important metaphor that when we connect with life, we restore health. When we connect with life, we're able to hold the things that are challenging and difficult and poisonous. Mm -hmm. And the more we move away from life, the more we lose that capacity. So, Sugeno-san rocks. Uh -oh. <laughs> the other thing I'd say is that, you know, if, uh, uh, if folks are interested in exploring some of the questions that, that we've been talking about, uh, 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 my book, after now, when we cannot see the future, where do we begin? Is one good resource that you can get from Amazon or from uh, the afternow.today website. Uh, uh, and for other, other resources looking at this, please come visit us at newstories.org. Thank you so much, Bob. Was was lovely. Was lovely to be in this space with you and Look forward for more conversations. Thank you, Ben, for holding this space with me. Uh, looking forward to see what you felt about the conversations, what this opened up for, for you out there who are listening to us. Thank you so much for being with us. Mm -hmm.